speech of the Munich Security Conference, the Prime Minister of the UK, Rishi Sunak. Prime Minister. The United Kingdom will always be on the side of freedom, democracy and the rule of law. And the security of our European continent will always be our overriding priority. Now, there's no greater example of those commitments than our response to the war in Ukraine. Just this year, we became the first country in the world to provide tanks to Ukraine and the first to train pilots and Marines. We gave £2.3 billion last year, and we will match or exceed that in 2023. Now, other allies can tell a similar story, and our collective efforts are making a difference. But with every day that passes, Russian forces inflict yet more pain and suffering. Now, the only way to change that is for Ukraine to win. So, we need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield to win the war, and a political strategy to win the peace. To win the war, Ukraine needs more artillery, armoured vehicles and air defence. So now is the moment to double down on our military support. When Putin started this war, he gambled that our resolve would falter. Even now, he is betting that we will lose our nerve. But we proved him wrong then, and we will prove him wrong now. Together, we're delivering as much equipment in the next few months as in the whole of 2022. And together, we must help Ukraine to shield its cities from Russian bombs and Iranian drones. And that's why the United Kingdom will be the first country to provide Ukraine with longer-range weapons. And it's why we're working with our allies to give Ukraine the most advanced air defence systems and build the air force they need to defend their nation. Now, of course, the United Kingdom stands ready to help any country provide planes that Ukraine can use today. But we must also train Ukrainian pilots to use the most advanced jets. And that's exactly what Britain is doing so that Ukraine has the capability to defend its security for the long term. But to win the peace, we also need to rebuild the international order on which our collective security depends. First, that means upholding international law. The whole world must hold Russia to account. We must see justice through the ICC for their sickening war crimes committed whether in Bucha, Irpin, Mariupol or beyond. And Russia must also be held to account for the terrible destruction it has inflicted. We are hosting the Ukraine Recovery Conference in London this June, and we should consider together how to ensure that Russia pays towards that reconstruction. Now, second, the treaties and agreements of the post-Cold War era have failed Ukraine. So we need a new framework for its long-term security. From human rights to reckless nuclear threats, from Georgia to Moldova, Russia has committed violation after violation against countries outside the collective security of NATO. And the international community's response has not been strong enough. As Jens Stoltenberg has said, Ukraine will become a member of NATO. But until that happens, we need to do more to bolster Ukraine's long-term security. We must give them the advanced NATO standard capabilities that they need for the future. And we must demonstrate that we'll remain by their side, willing and able to help them defend their country again and again. Ukraine needs and deserves assurances of that support. So ahead of the NATO summit in Vilnius, we will bring together our friends and allies to begin building those long-term assurances. And our aim should be to forge a new charter in Vilnius to help protect Ukraine from future Russian aggression. Now let me conclude with one final thought. What's at stake in this war 
is even greater than the security and sovereignty of one nation. It's about the security and sovereignty of every nation. Because Russia's invasion, its abhorrent war crimes and irresponsible nuclear rhetoric are symptomatic of a broader threat to everything we believe in. From the skies over North America to the suffering on the streets of Tehran, some would destabilize the order that has preserved peace and stability for 80 years. They must not prevail, and we need not be daunted. As President Zelensky said when he addressed the UK Parliament last week, we are marching towards the most important victory of our lifetime. It will be a victory over the very idea of war, and we could have no greater purpose than to prove him right. Thank you. Prime Minister, thank you. Uh, your speech, I thought, was very clear. Basically, Ukraine has to win the war and Russia loses. But you said something I want to pick up on and elaborate. You talk about NATO assurances for Ukraine. What does that mean specifically, and when do you do them? Do you do them while the war is still ongoing? And don't you fear that Russia will say, ultimately, we're right. We don't fight Ukraine. We fight NATO. Well, uh, Marie, nice to see you. I think, first of all, it's, it's clear that the security guarantees, the architecture that was in place, before this war has failed Ukraine. Right? That's just a statement of fact. Uh, Ukraine had received assurances when it gave weapons up. Russia has continually violated, whether it's human rights treaties or indeed arms control treaties. So what happened before has not worked. So we should be clear about that. And now our job is to look forward and say, what's the right thing going forward? Now, as I mentioned, Jens Stoltenberg has said, NATO, you know, well, Ukraine will be a member of NATO. But between now and then, what I think we need to work on are providing Ukraine with the means to win the war right now. And that means very specifically artillery, long range weapons, armored vehicles, air defense. That's the most critical thing. What we can also do is make sure that we're training Ukraine on NATO standard equipment. That's what we're doing when it comes to aircraft with their pilots. Uh, but I think what we do need to do is think about the future of how we protect Ukraine's security. And we need to have that conversation with our allies and talk about the longer term provision of supporting Ukraine. And that's the conversation that I think we should start having because the Vilnius summit is a good place to conclude that. So this year, so the assurances would come this year. I wonder, there has been a lot of debate. You talked about the fighter jets. Uh, there has been a lot of debate here about the ammunition, the risk that they may not have enough ammunition, but also the long range missiles. There's concern that perhaps one of the targets would be Crimea. Under your watch as UK Prime Minister, would you approve of long-range missiles that could hit Crimea? I think, I think the most important thing here to recognize is, it actually starts with NATO. What is NATO? NATO is a defensive alliance. Mm -hmm. right? That's the first thing to recall. What is Ukraine doing? Ukraine is trying to defend itself. Mm -hmm. right? It is suffering unprovoked aggression. Its territorial integrity, its sovereignty has been violated. Its people are being killed. And it has every right to defend itself. And that's what we should be doing. And that's the support that we collectively in this room are, are providing. And critically, there are things that Ukraine needs to gain that decisive advantage on the battlefield. That's why the provision of heavy tanks was so important. That's why air defense is absolutely critical. You're right to mention artillery. And longer range weapons also help. Uh, now, those are all the things that will allow Ukraine to defend itself and repel Russian aggression. And indeed, yes to have a counter-offensive that moves Russia outside of its own country. I think that's entirely reasonable, and we should be fully behind Ukraine in that ambition and want that ambition to succeed. And for them, the entire country means Crimea, as you know uh, very well. Uh, I, in your speech, there was a lot of bravado in the sense of Ukraine has to win the war and Russia has to be proven wrong. Vladimir Putin has to lose uh, this war. Some would say, and you make it clear, you still believe the UK is a big geopolitical agent. Zelensky obviously went to London. He sees value in the UK, but some here would believe to really be the strong geopolitical agent, you need to solve the pending issues that you have with the EU. I know you probably know this question is coming. There's a frenzy of reports that you do have a deal over the Northern Irish Protocol that could come Monday, potentially. Do you have a deal? Does it come Monday? And I wonder beyond that, does it reflect your wish that you want to have a normal working relationship with your European allies? So 
lots of things in there to, to unpack. I think that the first thing to say, when it comes to the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol, there are real issues that need resolving. The way that the protocol has been implemented, it's causing very real challenges for families, for people, for businesses on the ground. Very practical difficulties and they need to be resolved, but that also there's an issue of the democratic deficit that sits at the heart of the protocol as it's currently constructed. Now those are the things that we need to resolve. And I'm working very hard together with my ministerial colleagues, foreign secretaries in the audience, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. You know, we are working very closely together. We're engaging in those conversations with the European Union. Next week, but, uh, potentially? All the time, and we have been for a while. But what I'd say is there is still work to do. I think that there is still work to do. There are still challenges to work through. We have not resolved all these issues. No, there, is no, there isn't a deal that has been done. There, there is an understanding of what needs to be done. It's the issues that I outlined. And James was in, in Brussels yesterday. I've been in Northern Ireland talking to parties there about the things that we need to fix. Uh, we're working through those. We're working through them hard. And we will work through them intensely with the EU. But we are by no means done. There is no deal that is done. There, there's work to do. And that's what we will set about doing.